Hello, everybody. Hello. So my name is Martin Kletman. I'm a researcher at the University of Cambridge. I'd like to talk about some of the work on formal verification that we've done recently, which always starts with the question, if you're writing a program, how do you know that the program is correct or not? How do you know that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing? And for most people, of course, the answer to this is testing. So you write tests in which you think up some examples of inputs that you want to give to your program, and you run that input through the program and see what comes out at the other end and check that it is what you expected. The limitation here, of course, being that you only test those inputs that you thought of. If there are any uh, inputs that would cause a bug that you didn't think of, they're not in your tests. So people try to extend this model. For example, property-based testing, the idea is that you generate a whole lot of random inputs according to some pattern and check whether some property always holds of those. Um, that already broadens the scope of the inputs that we can test. Taking it a little bit further still, uh, model checking is getting a bit of attention. The idea here being that you write an abstract description of what your system or your algorithm is doing. And a model checker will then try to systematically try through all the possible combinations of what could possibly happen. The problem here, however, is that you get an exponential state explosion. And so if what you're testing is a distributed algorithm where messages could be delivered in any order, quickly you end up with a vast number of, probability, a vast number of possibilities to try through. And what people have to do in practice with model checking is to bound the size of the model and to say, for example, we will test only runs of the system in which a maximum of five messages are sent. And, well, if there's a bug in your system that only occurs if six messages are sent, you won't find that. So formal proof is right at the other extreme here, where actually we want to guarantee that some properties hold in absolutely all possible uh, circumstances. Even if there's an infinite state space, we still want to be able to prove that certain properties hold in every possible uh, configuration of a system, even if they're infinitely many. So proof is kind of hard work, I must admit. So you might rather wonder whether it is at all the bother. I will try to motivate it very briefly. So for like very run-of-the-mill code, it's probably not worth bothering with, with proof. Uh, because it is a fair amount of effort, and if like, the code is kind of obvious what it's doing, and there's not much ambiguity, okay, fine, you don't need proof. So it's most useful for algorithms that are very subtle, or algorithms that have a very big state space. So in distributed systems, this does occur a lot, uh, or general concurrent algorithms, where you know, any sort of things could happen concurrently. Different nodes might execute steps in arbitrary orders. Messages might be never delivered, or delivered out of order, or duplicated, or delivered uh, 10 days later, or whatever. Um, so for those kind of algorithms, formalization is super helpful, mostly actually because it helps us as humans understand these algorithms better and help us think through really systematically what's going on here. But there's also another motivation for wanting to do this kind of thing, and this is a quote from my collaborator, Dominic, who said that uh, Isabel, which is the software I'll be talking about today, is the world's most complicated video game. You know, uh, you know, we're talking about mathematical proof here, which people don't normally associate with games, but I must say it is actually quite fun. It is really like a sort of puzzle game where you're trying to figure out, oh, I could try and combine this fact with that fact, but I'm still missing something else from over here, so maybe I can get that from there, and then I can combine these things, and then, oh, look, it works. So I would like to give you a bit of a taste of what this kind of proof looks like uh, if we're using some proof software like Isabel. And I will, as an example, use a distributed system so I wanted to show an example that is a bit non-trivial so that you know, we can actually talk about something uh, that, that looks a bit interesting. This also means that I won't have time to go through the entire proof in the 40 minutes we have here. But I'll try to show you at least a few key moments so that you get a flavor, a bit of a taste of what it looks like. And so we can, Isabel, uh, or Isabel slash hole is the program we're using here. It doesn't actually have built-in support for distributed systems. It just works on standard data structures like lists and sets and things like that. 
But it turns out that we can model a distributed system very simply using about 50 lines of code or so. And what I'm going to do is, within that model of a distributed system, formalize a simple consensus algorithm. So you might have heard of consensus algorithms such as Paxos or Raft. I'll be talk talking about a simpler one today because uh, Paxos is a bit too big, again, to talk about in this talk. Uh, but it will have the fundamental property that we want consensus algorithms to have. So what makes a consensus algorithm correct is, in particular, the agreement property. And that is, if you've got two processes in the system that are trying to reach consensus, then at some point, those processes learn or decide a value. And if that happens, if two, any two processes have decide, decided a value, then those values must be the same. That is, they agree on the value that they have decided. So the protocol or the algorithm we will use will look like this. I'll show you as an example here. So the example is the usual consensus example of trying to agree where to go for lunch. And so the red user at the top here uh, would like to go and eat tacos, and uh, the blue user at the bottom would like to eat falafel. And the way our consensus algorithm is going to work is we have two types of node. We have proposers, uh, which those are the two proposers marked here right now. And we have one special node that is called the acceptor. And so this is Paxos terminology. Uh, the, we only have one acceptor uh, node, and it is in charge of making the, the decision uh, of where everyone's going to go for lunch. And the way it's going to make this decision is very simple. Uh, whenever a proposer wants to go to lunch in a particular place, it sends a proposal message to the acceptor, and the acceptor simply sits there waiting for proposal messages to come in. And the first time the acceptor receives a proposed message with a particular value, in this case falafel is the first one it receives, it decides that value. And then it sends back a message to the proposer saying, yes, your value was accepted. Whatever proposals arrive later at the acceptor, they get told, sorry, um, this, uh, a value has already decided. So in this case here, falafel was already decided, so the proposal of tacos uh, arrived, arrived later, and so the Proposer 1 is going to get back a message, no, sorry, I have already accepted falafel. And so this is a simple consensus algorithm. It works. And it has the property, uh, this, this agreement property, that at the end, Proposer 1 and Proposer 2 both have the same decided value of falafel. So let's model this. So we have here three communicating entities, and we have time going from left to right. And we can split this time into time steps into discrete time steps. And we're going to say in each time step, one of the nodes does something. In particular, one of the nodes handles some kind of event. And so, for example, in the first time step, the event is that the red user makes a request. In the second time step, the uh, event is that the blue user makes a request. As a side effect of handling these events, the, the proposers send messages to the acceptor and those messages arrive at some later point in time. And so at the third time step, the event here is that, oh, a message has been received. So the acceptor has received a message from the proposer. In the fourth time step, again, a message was received. And in the fifth and sixth time steps, then the two uh, accept messages are received. So what we can do here is to model the execution of this distributed system as just a linear sequence of time steps. And in each time step, one of the processes takes some kind of action. So this kind of model is actually very similar to what TLA plus does, for example. It also breaks an execution into just a linear sequence of time steps. And the way we are going to describe our algorithm now is essentially as an event handler. So we can define a step function, a function that takes three arguments and returns a pair of two arguments. So the three arguments that it takes are firstly the process ID, so which process is executing right now, secondly, the current state of that particular process, and thirdly, the event that occurred, for example, receiving a message. And then that function is going to return two things. It's going to return a new state, uh, so the process moves, moves from the current state to the new state, and it returns a set of messages to send to other nodes. That may be no messages at all, or it might be several messages or just one message. And so we can uh, use this, uh, this kind of model here to encode the algorithm in Isabel. 
So I will show you just a little bit of introduction to Isabel syntax so that you can read the examples that I'll show you in a moment. So I'm just going to compare it to Python arbitrarily because hopefully most people have seen at least a bit of Python. So you can define a function in Isabel and uh, in this case the identity function that just returns the argument that you give it. Uh, in Isabel, there, there are several different keywords, actually, in this case, fun and definition, which can both be used to define functions. They have slightly different properties, but the distinction is not really important for our purposes today. Secondly, you can have anonymous functions, also known as lambdas. So uh, in Python, you would write out the word lambda. In uh, Isabel, you just use the Greek letter lambda. Lambda x dot x is, again, the identity function that returns x. And finally, if you want to call a function or apply some argument to a function, uh, in most programming languages, you will have the function name and then in parentheses, the argument. Uh, Isabel uses a more ML-like syntax in which you simply have the function name space argument. And so any arguments are just separated by spaces like this. We still have parentheses, but only for grouping, not for function invocation. OK, so that's enough syntax for now. Let's go back to this example. So we want to write down some code that will implement this particular consensus algorithm here. And I'm going to start with pseudocode just to ease us into the situation. And so we will have separate co code for the proposer or any proposer and the acceptor. And this is written kind of like an event handler. So the proposer, when the proposer receives a user request, it will send that proposed value to the acceptor. And so those are the, those first two arrows that are happening here. Um, and then later, when the proposer learns, uh, gets, receives a response back from the acceptor, it will learn that decided value. So that proposer will then update its own local state to say, ah, I know now what the decided value is, um, and we want that to, to agree with everybody else. And then on the acceptor side, the acceptor doesn't receive any user requests directly. It only receives messages over the network from the proposers. So whenever the acceptor receives a proposal from a proposer, it needs to check its local state. If it has already decided a value, then it just sends that previously decided value back. Otherwise, if it has not yet decided a value, then it now takes that opportunity to decide the value and sends that value back. And so that's what we have here happening in the middle on the acceptor. And so I think we should go into Isabel and show you uh, what this actually looks like. So here we have uh, Isabel. It's, uh, it uses a, a kind of interactive IDE, as you can see here. And at the beginning here is just uh, essentially the file name, and we've imported network, which is a, a small library that I've defined uh, just for the purposes of modeling a distributed system. Uh, if we have time, I can show you that as well. Otherwise, uh, all of this code is online, so you can look at it in your own time as well. So first of all, we're going to define a, a data type for messages. And so this is just like a tagged union type, like you get in many programming languages. So a message is either a proposal message containing a value or an accept message containing a value. And the value here is just a type variable uh, saying it can be of any data type. It's polymorphic. And then we have uh, definitions of the step function for the proposer and the step function for the acceptor. And these exactly match the uh, pseudocode that we had just now. So let's see for the proposer, we had firstly handling the user request. So here, this is handling the user request. Um, this function here, the, the function arguments are written using pattern matching. Uh, so again, like what you get in ML or even Rust, uh, you get this kind of pattern matching of the arguments, which is quite a nice way of writing things. And the function is written here that the first argument here that is none is the local state, the current state of the function. So I've defined here the, the local state of each node is an option type. It starts off as none because no value has been decided. And then once a value has been decided, it goes to some x. And so here we're saying we're in the state where no value has already been decided, but we get a user request uh, for some value val. And this function is going to return a pair of two things. So it's going to return, first of all, the new local state. The new local state just remains none here on the proposer. And secondly, a set of messages to send. And here, we're going to send a proposed message containing that value to 0. So 0 here is the recipient of the message. And I'm going to just take the convention that the acceptor is node number 0, 
and proposes our nodes number one, two, three, et cetera, as many nodes as we like. And so here the curly braces are to denote a set. It's a set containing one element, namely the sending of this one proposal. So this is handling a user request here. And the second line here is then handling the response. And so here we're pattern matching on the event. And here the event is to receive a message. And uh, the message that we're receiving is an accept message. And so if we receive an accept message, now we will update our local state. And so our local state now goes from none to some value. And we're going to not send any more messages. So just empty set here for the set of messages we send. So you can see here this, um, this language we have here in Isabel. It's an ML-style functional programming language. Actually, um, Isabel kind of has a two levels of, of language. So you can notice here that each line is uh, enclosed in these little uh, angle brackets. So everything outside of the angle brackets is the, the outer language, which is actually Isabel, which is uh, a basically a, a very abstract logic language. And inside the, inside the, the little uh, braces is Hull uh, for higher order logic, which is kind of a functional programming language. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that while most programming languages are built to be evaluated, like you call a function and then it results in some return value, the Isabel functional programming language here is more designed to be symbolically manipulated. And so we don't just call a function. We actually take the definition of that function and manipulate it in ways that uh, follows the rules of logic. And through doing that, we can then prove things about it. OK, so that's the proposer function. On the acceptor, here in the pseudocode, we said, when we receive a proposal from the proposer, we look at our local state, depending on whether the local state is decided or not. We either decide a new value or keep the existing value. And so we have exactly the same here. Uh, on the acceptor, the acceptor is in some existing state state, and it receives a proposal, uh, a proposal from the sender, some sender. And what we're going to do here is match on pattern match on that case, uh, on the state. If the state is none, that means there's no decided value so far. So now we're going to decide a value. So the new local state is some value. And we're going to respond to the sender by sending back an accept message. On the other hand, if the uh, acceptor has already decided a value previously, that is, the state is some v, then the state will remain some v. We're never going to change the decided value once it's been decided. But we still send back a message to the proposer saying, hey, actually, I've decided this other value already. And this last line here is just the wild card, which covers all of the other cases. And so I have that both in the proposer and in the acceptor function. And so here I'm saying uh, the proposer is in some state. For every other event that might re be received, we remain in the same state, and we don't send any messages. And so this is just a no-op, saying we're going to ignore anything else that might happen. So this is enough to define the algorithm here. The only last thing I need to do is define the step function here takes as first argument the process ID. And so I'm going to say, if the process is 0, then the code we're running is the acceptor, which I said just now is 0 is the acceptor. Any other number is going to be a proposer. And so this is now enough to define the algorithm. So what we want to do now is prove some interesting things about it. So uh, what we want to prove is the agreement property. And I will just, again, introduce just a little bit of mathematical notation in case uh, you've not seen it before or have forgotten since your uh, undergraduate degree. Uh, so logical implication is uh, this double arrow, the arrow pointing from left to right. And what this says is that if the stuff on the left-hand side of the arrow is true, then the thing on the right-hand side must also be true. And so on the left-hand side, we can have assumptions. The little hat uh, thing means and. So if the statement p1 is true and the statement p2 is true and all of these statements up to pn are true, if they are all true, then we can conclude that the statement q is also true. Sometimes this is written as repeated arrows. Uh, so you can write, the, write this equivalently. They, they mean exactly the same. OK, and what we want to prove is this agreement property here that I showed you earlier. So let's formalize that. Let's state this property a bit more carefully. So I'm going to say, sorry, the text is a little bit small. Uh, assume that the variable states corresponds to 
the state of all of the processes after we have executed this consensus algorithm. In particular, after we've ex executed any number of steps of the consensus algorithm. So it might be that no steps have been executed, or might be that 100 million steps have been executed. We're not going to take any upper boundary here on how long the algorithm will run for. And we're also going to assume that the state of process one is some value one, and the state of process two is some value two. And so, assuming those three things, what we want to prove is that value one must equal to value two. So this is just saying any two processes that have decided must have decided the same value. Now, let's write this in Isabel. So we are here, and, and we're going to, we want to write a theorem. I can give uh, a name to that theorem. I'm just going to call it agreement for now. And I'm going to write these three assumptions that correspond exactly to what we had just here. So first of all, we need to somehow say that this is the execution of our consensus algorithm. And for that, I have predefined this little function called execute, um, which is it's defined in a separate file here. I can show you that later. And we're going to say we execute uh, the algorithm where the step function is consensus step. So that's the, just the function that I defined up here. And furthermore, we need to give this uh, the initial state and the initial state is going to be a function from process uh, ID to the state of that particular process. And I want all functions to, uh, all processes to start off in the state none, because it's an option type, and we want everyone to start off in the state none. So we can just write a function here uh, that takes some process ID and always returns none. And so this will be the states of all of the processes. This is just saying all of the processes are in the state none. Uh, so the third argument that I need to give here is the set of processes that exist in the system. But actually, I don't need to limit which processes I exist, so I'm just going to give it the universal set of all possible processes. And then we have three more variables, which is the events, the messages, and the states. And so this, um, what this here is saying is that this event here is a list of events that occurred, so a list of uh, messages that were delivered or users that made requests. And, um, and so this is a valid sequence of events uh, in which the set of messages that were sent is this variable messages. And the final states of all of the processes is this variable states here. And this is an execution of the algorithm with these three parameters. So with the consensus step, with the initial state, and the set of processes. And so under this assumption, uh, we can now say what the state of some process should be. Uh, so the state of process one should be some value one, yes? And similarly, the state of process two should be some value two. And under these assumptions, we want to show that value one equals value two. Okay, so this is just a, a nice statement of the thing we want to prove. What I'm going to write here now for now is sorry. And so sorry is the Isabel keyword which just says, believe me, this is true. I'm not going to prove it. Um, now, of course, you might be wrong, and you might assert that something is true if it is not indeed true. But sorry is extremely useful while you're working on a proof, uh, because you can't prove everything at the same time. You have to start with some assumptions. And those assumptions, you can just fill out with sorry for now, and then come back to them later. And so the idea is you, you start with sorry at the top level and then gradually get rid of the sorries, all of the sorries in the program and then at the, uh, in the proof. At the end, once you've got rid of all of the sorries, then the computer has checked this proof and has verified that it is indeed true. So how do we do the proof for this now? Now, this is kind of interesting because it seems sort of obvious. Like, if you look at the description of the algorithm, it seems kind of obvious that any two nodes will end up deciding the same value. You know, it's just kind of looking at it. But here, for Isabel, in order to prove something formally, just like saying that it's obvious is not really good enough. So we have to break it down step by step. How does each step of the execution lead to the fact that everybody ends up in agreement? And the steps of the execution can be a user made a request, 
or an uh, proposed message was received, or an accept message was received. And so what is quite a common technique for proving these kind of things is to first prove some invariance. So we're going to prove some simpler facts which we think are going to be true at every step of the execution, and then hopefully from those invariants we can then deduce this agreement uh, property that we want to show here. And so coming up with the invariance is kind of the most creative part of the proof. So this is something that computers are pretty bad at, and this is why uh, a tool like Isabel is, is like an interactive proof assistant. It doesn't try to fully automatically run the proof by itself, because that's unfortunately undecidable, just like the halting problem. Uh, but instead, what we do is we have this kind of neat interaction between the human who kind of puts in some hypotheses and then help the computer helps check whether those things are actually true. And so I'm going to assert that there are two invariants which we can use in order to prove the agreement property. And this is the first one here. So I'm going to claim, <clears throat> I'm going to claim for any proposer P, if the state of P is some val, then there must exist some process that has sent an accept message to P with that value val. Uh, does this make sense? Yeah, I kind of think so, because, well, if we think the only way that a proposer can end up in the state of having decided some value is by having received an accept message. That is, if you look at here the definition of the function, the proposer, this is the only place where it sets its state to be some value, and it's in response to an accept message. So, okay, this looks plausible. Uh, second invariant, if, the if somebody in the system has sent an accept message, then the acceptor must be in the state some value. Well, sending an accept message, the only node that sends accept messages is the acceptor, and it sends it here on these two lines. And here, when it sends the accept message for val, it is in the state some val, and if it sends the accept message with value v, it is in the state some v. So this invariant also looks plausible, that whenever there's an, such an accept message, then the acceptor must be in that state. But it's not, immediately, so it's not immediately obvious that those two invariants are true, and it's also not immediately obvious that they are sufficient in order to prove the agreement property. And so this is where something like Isabel will be handy. So in order to write down these invariants, we have to write them a bit more formally as mathematical statements. And for this, a bit of more notation, you might have seen this, the upside down letter A means for all. And so this is saying here, for all possible values of the variable x, the statement P of x is true. And similarly, there exists. So this, up, this uh, inverted letter E here is the exists operator, and we're saying we can find some value x. There maybe might, might be more than one value, but there's at least one value x for which the statement P of x is true. And so using these, uh, these um, quantifiers, we can now write down these two invariants more formally. And so I am going to actually copy them from a separate file to save a bit of time here. So I'll put them in here. So our two invariants, first of all, the invariant one. So this is just restating it here in words. I'm saying for any proposer P. OK, so P or here I'm calling it proc. It's a proposer if its ID is not zero, because zero is the acceptor. So any process ID that is not zero must be a proposer. That's any proposer P. If the state of P is some val, that's what we have here. Remember, states is a function from process IDs to state. And so here, this is just saying states given the argument proc, and that function returns some value. Here we have the arrow, so that's the implication. That's this then here in the invariant. So if these two things are true, if the process is a proposer, and if the state of that process is some val, then the right-hand side of the arrow is true. And here the right-hand side of the arrow says there exists some sender process that sent uh, an accept message here to proc. So proc is the recipient of the sent message. This is the message that was uh, sent, and this is the sender. In this case, we don't even care who sent the accept message. We just say there exists some process that sent it, uh, and this we're saying here it exists in the set of messages. And we're saying this statement is true for all processes and all values, 
And this, so this definition here you can think of as a function that takes two arguments, which is the set of messages and the, set, uh, and the uh, map of states. So this is invariant one. Invariant two here, if a message except val has been sent, that is this bit here, so on the left-hand side of the implication, if some, uh, some accept value here, some accept value message exists, where there's some sender and some recipient, we don't care who the sender and recipients are, if this message exists, if that message was sent, then the state of the acceptor must be some value. So remember, zero is the acceptor, so the state of process zero must be some value. So I'm now interested in uh, figuring out, are these two invariants actually sufficient to prove this agreement property? And so for that, I'm going to add here an, another lemma. A lemma is just like a theorem, except it's like an intermediate result. I'm going to copy this assumption here. And I'm going to assert uh, that in any, ex in any valid execution of our algorithm, Invariant one holds, and invariant two holds. And I'm going to use sorry again just to say, like, okay, let's see, first of all, if those two invariants are sufficient in order to prove this. So I'm going to try and get rid of this sorry down here. And if it's sufficient, then we can actually check if the two invariants are also true. So here, let's try and prove this agreement theorem now. And now I'm going to go into Isabel's proof mode. And so when you want to make a proof, uh, just like a mathematical proof on pen and paper, often you need to make in steps of reasoning. So you say, OK, these are assumptions. What can we deduce from these assumptions? I'm going to say, well, from this assumption here, that the state of process is value 1, we should be able to deduce that somebody sent an accept message with value 1, and from that, by invariant 2, we should be able to deduce that the acceptor must be in state some value 1. So let's see if that is true. Uh, so let's say the state of the acceptor is some value 1, and see if we can deduce this from the assumptions we have here. And so I'm going to now invoke Sledgehammer. So Sledgehammer is an, an amazing command built into, the, into Isabel, which tries to find a proof automatically. And sometimes it succeeds, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, normally, this should work, but you know, this is the, the great thing with live demos. OK, am I missing something? Uh, do I need to what? What, use the, use the lemma here. It should be able to find this lemma automatically. OK, so I'll copy it from the other file. I might have just made a typo somewhere. Um, so here's our invariance lemma. Ah, there we go. OK, I must have typoed it somehow. So here we go. It's found a proof. And here's the proof that is found. So I can click this down here, and it's just going to put it in the file for me. And let me explain briefly what is going on here. So. Uh, Metis is one of several built-in proof methods in Isabel. So Isabel comes with uh, a whole suite of different proof algorithms, and different proof algorithms are good at solving different proof problems. And so just uh, yeah, Metis is one of those, and the arguments we give to Metis here are all of the facts that this proof algorithm should use. And so using assumptions one and assumptions two, that is these two assumptions, and using the definitions of the two invariants, and using the invariance lemma that we just defined here. So using all of those facts, it has been able to successfully prove that the uh, state of the, um, of the acceptor is indeed some value. So this is really cool. So at this point here, we're sure, because the computer has checked this proof, we can't have made a mistake in this step of the reasoning. So now we've done this for some value 1, but using the third assumption here, we should be able to make a similar conclusion for value 2. So let's say, moreover, we also have the state, or state of the acceptor must be some value 2. I'm going to sledgehammer this again. 
And again, we found the proof. Cool, OK. And the proof is probably going to look very similar to the last proof because it's essentially the same argument. It's just using assumptions one and three, whereas previously we used assumptions one and two. By the way, you see this, like, this little flashing. It briefly flashes up in purple. That's the time that Isabel is taking to check that proof. And once the purple has gone away, that means the proof is correctly checked. And so it's giving us this really nice interactive feedback. OK, now we have that the state of the acceptor must be value 1, and the state of the acceptor must be value 2. The only way how this works now is for value 1 and value 2 to be the same. So ultimately, we must be able to show from this that value 1 equals value 2. Let's see what Isabel thinks. And it thinks it's true. And using just, in this case, we're using a different proof method. We're using simp, which is a simplification. So that's just doing syntactic manipulations on uh, the statements. And the proof is done. So I can write QED, quad erat demonstrandum, and we have proved the theorem under this assumption, of course. We, remember, we still got the sorry here. But we're making progress. We have showed that these two invariants are indeed sufficient to prove this agreement property. I can show you, like, if I, for example, delete the invariant 2 here, then ah, this proof no longer works. It's just sitting there trying to prove this step but not succeeding because it turns out that just invariant 1 by itself is not strong enough. We do indeed need both of the invariants. OK, so let's put it back in. And now proof checks again. So this is nice. Um, another few little details about Isabel. So you can see it's a, it's a functional programming language, and we can do these manipulations on terms. It also, it's like uh, type inferred, that uses the uh, same kind of type inference as ML and OCaml. And, uh, and we have this uh, sledgehammer and a bit of proof automation, which helps us write the steps of the proof. So what would be interesting now is to look at how we actually prove these invariants. And the way this works, I will illustrate by a little picture. And so here, um, remember we have here, in, in our definition of execute, we have the sequence of events that occur. And each event can be either a, a user proposing or user requesting a value, or a message being received from the network, or maybe a timeout or something like that. And so those are the things that can occur. And each process will handle one event at a time. Process can handle events in any order. So it's not round robin or anything. It's just like arbitrary interleaving. Um, and all of the processes start off in the initial state. And for each uh, event, that event and the current state get fed into the step function to produce the new state. And so like this, we can kind of iterate over this list of events and processes that handle each event and deduce from that the states. And so what we're saying here now is assume that our invariants hold in this block of states here on the right-hand side. Assume that is the case. Then we can append one more event to the end. And that event will be executed by one of the processes. And that one process will update its local state. For all the other processes, the state will remain the same. And what we're saying now is that then the invariants are still true in states prime on the right-hand side. And this, if you remember some maths from college, looks very much like induction. And this is indeed an induction proof. And so what we need to prove is, firstly, some statement holds for the empty list. And moreover, we can prove that some statement holds for some, if, if some statement holds for some list XS, then we can append some value X to the list XS, and the statement still holds. And this is exactly what we want for these invariants. And so for the proof here, we break down uh, the proof into two steps. The base case, where we show that, some, that the invariants hold for the empty list of events, where nothing has happened, i.e. it holds in the initial state. And then secondly, we show that given some valid state, we can then apply one more event at the end of the list, and that is the inductive step. And from these, we can prove that the statement holds for all lists. And amazingly, look here, we have to do only two subproofs. We only have to prove the base case and the inductive step. But from these two things, we can deduce that this statement is true for all lists xs, regardless how lo of how long they are. So we've proved a statement about an infinite state space, but we've only had to do a finite amount of work in order to do this proof. 
So I'll show you very briefly, because I have one more minute, just how the start of an induction proof looks like in Isabel. And so here, I want to prove this uh, lemma here of the invariants. And I say I'm going to use the assumptions. And I'm going to do a proof by induction. I'm going to do induction over one of the variables. So the variable here is going to be the list of events. And we have to say messages and states are arbitrary. That means they can vary at each step of the induction. And finally, we need to define the rule that we're using. So I'm doing induction on lists. And with a, so the inductive step is going to be appending one item to the end of the list. That's what this, this rule here says. So I had to write that one line by hand. But now, here, there's some code generation I can use. So here we go. Look, now we've got immediately the base case and the inductive step as two uh, sub-goals here. And I've got sorry for each of those. And so now I can, for example, try and prove the base case. So the, the base case is basically just that this statement here, that the two invariants hold uh, for the empty list of events, i.e. in the initial state. So let's see if Sledgehammer can do that. There we go. Proof found. Give it a moment. There we go. So here, proof found. We're using, again, we're using a different proof method. This time, the proof algorithm is called fast force. And here, these are the, the various facts and lemmas that we're using in the proof of this. But here, we've proved the base case of the induction already. So next is now to do the step of the induction. But I'm afraid I'm out of time for that. So I will not be able to show you that today. I would, I'm thinking, actually, maybe I'll do like a video recording of this. Because if, if I had another hour, two hours, I would be able to run through the entire proof. Um, and, and it's actually quite interesting. Um, the remarkable thing here is that actually this induct, these, um, these invariants are the main creative step in the proof. So actually, by the time I've got here now, the rest of the proof is actually pretty mechanical. It's another about 200 lines or so of code to write. But a lot of those codes come from the automation. So I can just keep doing sledgehammer, sledgehammer, and all of the simple steps of the proof sledgehammer can do automatically. And there's actually not too much more creative thinking required. So from this point, actually, it's fairly doable. So that's about as much as I have time to talk about today, I'm afraid. If you're interested in the full proof, you can find it here. I just put it on a gist on GitHub. Uh, and I don't have time for questions, but I'll be here in the lunch break, so feel free to come up to me. Thank you so much for coming.